mobile phone footage of women being snatched off the streets in Chechnya. These images cut to Chechen wedding music are often posted on the internet by the kidnappers themselves. Many of the victims will be forced to marry their abductors. A bygone tradition with a modern twist. Chechens call it bride stealing. So that's the car, it's a BMV, we've been told to follow it. I've come to Chechnya to follow a case of bride stealing and the tense negotiations between the families involved. We've come for the girl and to be as one of the family with you. In a war-torn land where abductions and murders have become frighteningly routine, I discover the story of Chechnya's stolen brides. Zulikhan Ibrahimova is getting married. Sisters, cousins and aunties fuss over her dress. These are precious moments as Zulikhan doesn't know when she'll see them again. Her family was split up and scattered by the war with Russia. For her mother, Zulikhan's marriage is yet another painful separation. When will you next see her? <laughs> I don't know. Of course, I'd like to see my daughter every day. What can you do? She's no longer mine. She's theirs. The groom's family is on its way to claim its prize. Do you like my jolly little tea? <laughs> the wedding party arrives at the bride's house, many of them heavily armed. Inside the house, Mullah Alvi, the Muslim cleric who will conduct the wedding, gets proceedings underway. The elders give thanks to Allah, but for Ramzan, Zulikhan's grandfather, this celebration has come as a shock. A week ago, his granddaughter was kidnapped, and today she's going to marry the man who did it. <laughs> This is the kidnapper and groom, Bogdan Hajiev, a young aspiring businessman, being read his wedding vows. <laughs> Mullah Alvi is one of those who regularly deals with bride stealing. A week earlier, he'd agreed to let me watch him work. It was late at night when he first called me out on a job. We've just had a call from a mullah who says that he's just had a case of bride stealing and he's got a whole lot of sorting out to do with the family. So we're going to go off and uh, find out what's happening there. I set out to the house where the girl was being held. Sometimes bride stealing happens with a girl's agreement. At worst, it can result in violence at the hands of strangers. Islamic clerics like Alvi are often dragged from their beds at night as mediators and investigators. How's the girl feeling? Have you seen her? I've seen her, but I haven't spoken to her. She's feeling shy. I now have to talk to her in order to find out whether she's given her consent. In other words, whether she came willingly. In a back room, we found Hava, a 17-year-old schoolgirl about to get married in the middle of the night. Hava, did you come here of your own free will or did they force you? If you weren't forced to come here, just nod your head. Hava had agreed to get into the car and come to the young man's house. His mother explained why he was in such a rush to get married. We're all in shock. He was afraid someone else would steal her, so he took her and brought her here. Is she going to sleep here? Of course, this is her home now. 
She looks very um, distressed. She keeps on twisting her fingers together and looking down. Although this has been planned, she's a bit shocked by the fact that it's actually now happening and the fact that her parents are obviously um, quite anxious and uh, maybe will be fiercely against this match. We set off with Alvi to meet Harva's parents, who live at the other end of the Chechen Republic. Chechnya may be part of Russia, but in cases of bride stealing, people call the mullahs, not the police. For Chechens, it's basically accepted that any problem is resolved within the clans. Others may think this is savagery, but for us, it's the order of things. Harva's father had a face like thunder, but he listened respectfully to Alvi. The girl is in agreement. I asked her myself. I think they behaved correctly without any deceit or violence. So, do you agree to the marriage, Vaka? There's nothing to be done here. She got into the car herself. She must have known where she was going. The mullah says he's from a good family, an upright family. I can vouch for them. You see, he vouches for them. He's the imam of the mosque. How can I not trust him what he says? My first experience of bride stealing ended peacefully. It was more like an elopement. The next evening, Alvi phoned again. He had another case to deal with, only this time the situation was more serious. It was the night Zulikhan was stolen. So that's the car. It's a BMW. We've been told to follow it. Um, we're going um, to the bride's house. Mullah Alvi and some representatives of the groom's family are in that car ahead of us. We're not going to be allowed to film anything when we get to the girl's house because the situation there is incredibly tense and um, Mullah Alvi's worried that it could easily erupt into violence. Two hours earlier, Zulikhan had been bundled into a waiting car by Bogdan and his friends. Her family was furious, but Bogdan's relatives hoped to convince them to let him marry her. Negotiations between the elders of both families and Mullah Alvi took place in an upstairs room. Our fixer, Rustam, kept us updated. I went to see Alvi and asked him what's going on. He said he hadn't realized the situation was so tense. They didn't agree to give the girl to the family. Zulikhan's family had prevailed, but Bogdan's family had certainly not given up. They talked to the girl's grandfather, and he said, let's negotiate further tomorrow or the day after. So there's a small chance she might agree? Yes, they do have a small chance. We drove back to the capital in the early hours and awaited further developments. After two wars for independence from Russia, Grozny was almost completely destroyed. Since the ceasefire, the Kremlin has bankrolled a huge reconstruction program. The centerpiece is Grozny's main mosque. It's a $20 million symbol of just how important Islam has become in post-war Chechnya. The next day, I went to see Mullah Alvi at his mosque in the village of Yandi. Yandi was the scene of heavy fighting during the war and was once considered a rebel stronghold. Alvi told me more about the stealing of Zulikhan the night before. They met up a few times and he asked her to marry him. She said, let's wait a couple of years. But he's young and he didn't want to wait, so he decided to force her into a car and brought her here. At first, she said she would marry him, but when her parents came, she told them that she was against it and they took her back. 
Were they angry? Of course. We don't like it when girls are taken by force. It can get really nasty. People have even been known to kill each other. I followed Alvi to his mosque where he was holding a zikr, a Sufi Muslim ritual in which the faithful seek to leave this world behind and remind themselves of God. During the wars with Russia, Chechen fighters performed this ritual before going into battle. Then it was mainly a symbol of defiance. Now it's an overt display of Chechen identity. I wondered how mullahs like Alvi have become so influential in Chechnya. Now it's supposedly back in the fold and part of Russia, a secular state. A year ago, I visited Grozny's football stadium. The president of the local team, Terek, is 33-year-old Ramzan Kadyrov. He also happens to be the president of Chechnya. He got the job six years ago, after his father was assassinated in this very stadium. Having once fought the Russians, Kadyrov is now their number one ally. After the game, I was summoned by one of his aides. He told me to move quickly if I wanted to meet the president. I'm proud to be my father's son. I'm proud to stand where he once stood. And we're going to win and exterminate terrorism, fundamentalism, and our culture will be reborn. In return for his allegiance to Moscow, President Kadyrov gets a free hand to run Chechnya. Ironically, this has given him the means to put Islamic law above Russian law. Islam gives us peace, as do the traditions of our Chechen nation. Can men have a second wife? And a third and a fourth, why not? It's our right according to Sharia law, and it goes with our Chechen mentality. Anyone who wants to get married, let them get married. What about the headscarf? A headscarf is compulsory, as is a long dress. If you can see the whole of a woman, she'll look like a doll. But if she's covered, then that makes a woman more attractive. That's why I like covered women, and I'm carrying out a propaganda campaign to make sure all women are covered and worthy. Kadyrov is allowed to promote his own brand of Islam, so long as he does Moscow's bidding and smothers the insurgency he was once a part of. <laughs> These days, he personally oversees operations to hunt down and kill Chechen separatists. This week, we've exterminated 17 or 18 bandits. We never forgive. Our vengeance is always brutal. We know the names of all the people who were involved in the murder of our comrades, and they will all be exterminated. I declare this as President of the Chechen Republic. Mullah Alvi is one of Kadyrov's new generation of Muslim clerics. He studied Islamic law in Egypt and was appointed a year ago. With Zulikhan's kidnapping still unresolved, he invited me for lunch, and he was keen to tell me about the role of Islamic Sharia law in modern Chechnya. Are these Sharia law books? What are the Sharia Yes, these are Sharia law. Sharia is not aggressive, it's not fundamentalism. Sharia is the law of Allah, it's fairness. And what does Sharia say about bride stealing? It absolutely forbids it. A bride must only get married by her own free will. Sharia law strictly forbids it. Everyone knows it's forbidden, but they still do it. 
Совершают. As the food was served, the conversation turned to Zulikhan's kidnapping. Although Sharia condemns bride stealing, and officially so does the government, Alvi seemed confident there would be a wedding. I'm positive it'll work out in the end. Authority figures from each clan will get together to resolve the problem. There are some people involved in this who you can't go against. But what if the girl's really against it? Sometimes they can be very much against it, but they still give her away. This happens. But it's somebody's life. Of course, this is all determined by the Almighty. I soon discovered why he had such a relaxed attitude to bride stealing. Could you tell me how you met your wife? Should I ask her? Oh, she'll tell you everything. With his permission, I had a word with his wife, Macha. When they met, Muller Alvi was already married to another woman. I didn't know him personally. He used to see me around, but he could never make up his mind whether to make my acquaintance or not. Then some time went by, and he continued watching me, or he'd appear around the house. Then he decided to kidnap me. His friends jumped out and grabbed me by the arms and legs. I sat down to make it harder for him to pick me up. I stretched out my legs, but he still managed to drag me, and there was gravel on the ground, and the stones were scraping my legs. <laughs> I don't regret anything now. He's a good lad. He doesn't smoke and doesn't drink, nothing like that. Honestly, I'm glad now, I swear. Of course, I could have married another man. There was somebody else, but I don't have any regrets. He's a good man. Macha says her kidnapping had a happy ending. That's not always the case. <laughs> Previously, I met Medina, who was stolen for marriage when she was 17. They called my parents and told them they had taken their daughter. My parents found out where I was and they came and took me back. A week later, the same guy chased me on the street. The second time he didn't waste any time. He raped me. Then he took me to his relatives and said, now you are my wife, no one can take you back. I then went to live at his house and I discovered I was pregnant from that one time he raped me. I wanted to slash every vein in my arm, as you can see, so that I didn't have to live anymore. Medina's husband was killed in the war. Shortly after his death, she was forced into marriage once again. When she moved into her new husband's house, she got yet another shock. It turned out that he was already married and had children. I felt awful. I didn't know where to turn. I was ashamed. And the worst thing is that people here blame women for everything. That's how people think here. Medina went to live with her new husband in the village of Valeric, in the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains. Valeric is also home to Zulikhan's family. After being stolen, Zulikhan's relatives managed to get her released and she'd now left the village while the crisis was resolved. I was greeted by her grandfather, Ramzan. Is this the first time they stole a girl in your family? Yes, yes, this is the first time. He didn't behave well, that young guy. He didn't behave well at all. For us Chechens, it's shameful. It's a scandal. And if they had come and asked me for her hand, I'd have given her to them. You'd have said yes? I would have agreed, yes. Ramzan is a classic Chechen patriarch. He's had four wives, 22 children and 78 grandchildren. 
His fourth wife, Aminat, told me what happened the night Zulihan was stolen. He went to find her at her university and they stole her. The girl was crying. She was screaming, take me home. She said, if you want me to, I will agree, but I didn't want to marry at all. It's a boy I've only seen two or three times, and I didn't even like him. The preeminence of traditional Chechen law gave Zulikhan's family little room for maneuver. They felt her reputation had been sullied by the kidnapping, and so were under pressure to give her up. For us, it's shameful to turn people down if they ask for her hand in marriage. That's the way it is. I headed back to Yandi, a half-hour drive from Zulikhan's village. It's home to the family of Bogdan, the kidnapper, who is keeping a low profile. I went to the house where he took Zulikhan the night he stole her. What's your name? My name's Nona. So who are you in the family? I'm one of the aunties. I'm the one who chose the bride. I know her family. You chose the bride? Yes. We liked the girl, the groom liked the girl, and, well, he didn't want to wait a year or two and get to know her, and, you know, it all happened so quickly. He called his mates, and they came, they chucked her in the back of a car. So you weren't surprised they stole her? Not at all. We can allow ourselves this luxury. If we see a girl we like, we're allowed to steal her. Look, there's my son. I'll introduce you. He's the one who stole her. Pleased to meet you. I'm Lucy. Are you Bogdan? I'm Salman. At the family home, I spoke to Bogdan's brawny cousin Salman about his role in the kidnapping. She was coming back from college and Bogdan was speaking to her. And at the required moment, I grabbed her and threw her in the car and that was it. How did she react? Did she scream? Yes, at everybody, at the groom, at me, at everyone. What did she say to you? It was in Chechen. It's difficult to translate, but she was very angry. Bogdan's uncle Vacha was one of the negotiators the night he stole Zulikhan. In anticipation that the wedding would go ahead, he showed me the bull he would slaughter for the guests. Which one, the white one or the brown one? No, the red one. The red one? He's massive. That's going to make loads of meat. It'll be around 200 kilograms. 200 kilograms? Yes, 200 or so. Vacher and Nonna explained that all they needed now was a yes from Zulikhan's grandfather. If the granddad says yes, she has to agree. Isn't that right, Bacha? If the granddad says so, she goes, she marries him. Don't you think that's a bit cruel? Yes, it's cruel, but it's the law. What will happen if people don't observe these laws? If we don't observe our laws, then we will no longer be Chechens. If a Chechen doesn't follow his own laws, then he won't be a Chechen anymore. He'll be a Russian. If I take their laws, then I'm no longer who I am. After the two wars with Russia, Chechens seem more determined than ever to preserve their identity. Ramzan Kadyrov has his own version of Chechen values, and he promotes them to undercut the appeal of the Islamic insurgency. Magamed, a former rebel fighter, now works for the president's Center for Spiritual and Moral Education. Although officially they're against bride-stealing, he and his colleagues have other priorities. 
We stop young people on the street, and then we preach a sermon, and the young people ask questions, and we tell them what is written in the Quran and what the Prophet, peace be upon him, says. The lecture is about the dangers of alcohol and Wahhabism. The label Moscow applies to Muslims it considers politically suspect. The activists also encourage women to conform to Kadyrov's dress code. Islam forbids us to have women walking around half undressed. It's not right. Look at that girl. See how she's dressed? That's how it should be. The sermon's over and Mogomed's crew hand out leaflets telling people how to behave. Some women seemed uneasy. Who wasn't wearing a headscarf? I noticed that she just scurried behind the counter and went into um, the ladies' room. Are there women who say to you, I'm not interested, please go away? No, that would be unacceptable. All the passers-by that we stop are very anxious to stress how much they love Ramzan Kadyrov. But off camera, a woman's just told me, show everybody how we're not allowed to live here, how we're not allowed to breathe, how we're not allowed to do what we like. Caught between strict Chechen traditions and Islamic law, women here have few places to turn. Lipkhan Bazayeva runs an organization called Women's Dignity. She and her colleagues are among the very few attempting to protect women's rights under Russian law. Today they're at a school in Grozny talking to teenage girls about bride stealing. <laughs> As the girls giggle and blush, Lipkhan decided to address the class. Back at her office, Lipkhan explained why she had made such a speech. Sometimes young women convince themselves that this is also a good way of getting married. They romanticize it. I wanted to speak to the girls so that they would think again. They're chosen. They don't get to choose. Both men and women should get to make this choice. But stolen women like Zulikhan rarely get a choice. In Valeric, her fate was about to be decided. Muller Alvi arrived with the elders from Bogdan's family to ask for a final decision from her grandfather, Ramzan. Zulikhan herself was absent from the proceedings. I have a request. We have come for the girl with love, to ask for your granddaughter's hand and to be as one of the family with you. Once upon a time, and I even remember it, people were killed for this. It's true. I know three or four such cases. After they stole her, they touched her, and immediately the girl's relatives went to the man's house and took their women. That can happen. Ramsan explained why he had decided not to resort to violence. Our families are distantly related, and because of this, we've come to an agreement. For the sake of you and the Almighty, this match has been agreed upon. In just half an hour, it was all over. Ramzan has agreed to the wedding for the sake of Allah and the elders he respects from the other village who are his distant relatives. 
But most importantly, he's done it for the sake of Allah. The groom's family left in triumph. So they've gone, the deal's been clinched, and it's been decided that Zuli Khan will get married on Sunday to a man that she only met twice. The third time she saw him, he kidnapped her. It's all been decided by the head of the two families. She didn't have any say in it, as far as I can see. Women who are forced into marriage often become ill. A few days before Zulikhan's wedding, I went to visit the Islamic Medical Center in Grozny. One of President Kadyrov's pet projects, the center has been open for just over a year and is proving very popular. It's only 10.15 in the morning, but they've already had 55 people come and sign the registration. Um, apparently, there are about two or 300 patients here every day. One of the religious scholars, Muller Maybeck, was treating a woman who was stolen for marriage a few years ago. Her aunt said the family was at its wit's end. She wants to be alone all the time. She's quiet, she doesn't want to see anyone. Nothing makes her happy. The patients seem to have suffered some kind of breakdown, but I was baffled by Maybeck's diagnosis. She's possessed by an evil spirit who's made her break up with two husbands. She told me, you can kill me, but I'm not going to live with him. Maybeck allowed me to watch him perform an exorcism. The girl was speaking in a strange voice, and Meyerbeck later claimed it was the voice of the male genie possessing her. I really don't know what to make of some of that. A lot of the time I've got a really huge desire to burst out laughing and um, I have to really bite my tongue, but it's actually not very funny because this girl is uh, obviously very unhappy. She's had a very difficult life and um, watching her being beaten like that and shouted at is a, a very, very distressing thing to see. Meyerbeck says that 15 years of fighting has led to an increase in the number of possessed women. People's psychological and moral state has been destroyed by the war. People have been morally crushed and are physically exhausted as a result of this war. Satan can see that people are trying to rebuild their lives and he wants to hold on to them and he's been working on them for hundreds of years. Whatever I felt about his methods, Maybeck seemed genuinely committed to helping his patients. But the centre does have its critics. Lipkan Bazayeva of the Women's Dignity Center is one of them. Instead of going to get counseling, the woman will go to one of those mullahs or to a witch doctor, and they'll come up with all kinds of reasons for her problems. But her problems will only get worse. They won't be resolved. Many of the women who visit Lipkan's center have also been kidnapped for marriage. Pride stealing has become more prevalent in recent times. Last year we did a survey and out of 200 women, 40% had been kidnapped for marriage. The huge amount of violence that took place during the war has led to men becoming radicalized in their thinking. And the way women think has also changed because they are now resigned to many forms of violence. And bride stealing is violence.
Although the war in Chechnya is officially over, there's still a heavy Russian military presence here. There were only a few days to go before Zulikhan and Bogdan's wedding. And in Yandi, the atmosphere was tense following a series of attacks on Russian soldiers in the area. As the women prepared food for the wedding, helicopter gunships flew overhead. Are they looking for someone? There is a Russian base over there. This village is a real hot spot. It's very tense here. Look, there's a third one. Ah. Are you frightened? I hate it when they get that close. I haven't set foot in a plane since the first war. I can't bear that sound. Nona's son Salman, who helped kidnap Zulikhan, had suffered a traumatic childhood. What do you remember of the war? I'd rather not remember it. I'd rather not think about it at all. The war taught us a lot. What exactly? We saw so much blood that there's nothing in this life we haven't already seen. Nonna took me to what was left of her uncle's house. It was destroyed in 1995 when the Russians bombed and shelled the village. My relatives were dying before my eyes. I saw a little six-year-old girl. I won't ever forget it. I don't know if she'd been hit by shrapnel, but her stomach was split open. We couldn't do anything for her. We took her to the hospital, but it was useless. The child died before my eyes. Talking about the war can be dangerous in Chechnya, and Nonna chose her words carefully. It's impossible today to forget it all. Impossible. Not one self-respecting Chechen will ever forget what happened. I don't know how to explain it to you. I probably shouldn't talk about it. I have kids. You know our history. There you have it. There's an all-pervading fear in Chechnya, reminiscent of Stalinist Russia. Last year alone, human rights groups say forced disappearances were at the rate of one a week. This is Zelina Shidieva, dancing with one of her cousins in a home movie. She was 29 years old and was just starting out as a TV presenter. Zelina disappeared in May 2009 and hasn't been seen since. A relative approached me shortly afterwards, but was too scared to show her face on camera. No one saw anything. It's as though the earth swallowed her up. What theories did the police have? They thought she may have been kidnapped for marriage, but if that had been the case, we would have heard within a day or two. There was a suggestion that perhaps somebody in the military structures took her. The investigator told us some of the people working there are out of control. Last summer, Zelina's family enlisted the help of Natalia Estemirova, the local head of the Memorial Human Rights Group. She believes Zelina may have been kidnapped by a member of President Kadyrov's security services and taken to his home village of Khozy Yurt. Zalina's relatives said that she was seeing someone from Khozy Yurt. A year ago, in August, the mother of a girl who had been stolen for marriage came to me. After some time, it turned out that someone from Khozy Yurt had done it. It turned out he just wanted to have a good time with this girl. And I have reason to believe that he was not the only one. I know of cases where women are kept in brothels, and we have a number of brothels here for soldiers where such women are used. 
Zelina's case was just one of many disappearances and murders Natalia was investigating. One of the most horrific cases she was looking into was the killing of seven women thought to be prostitutes. It was in November when there was virtually no grass and you could easily see the girls' bodies. One of them was wearing red boots and could easily be seen from a distance. So far, no one has been charged for these crimes, but Natalia believed they were linked to members of the security services. It was one of dozens of cases she attributed to them, but Kadyrov himself has repeatedly denied many such allegations. Peace Day 2010 celebrating the official end of Russia's military operation in Chechnya and only two days before Zulikhan's wedding. Few people were on the streets. Those who turned up were mostly pro-government activists. Inside the city's theatre, the president clapped along as young women sang songs of praise. As part of the Peace Day celebrations, a firework display was planned in the village of Achkoy Martan. There, I finally caught up with Bogdan, the groom. When he saw me, he didn't seem overjoyed. Is that Bogdan? Is that the groom? Bogdan, Bogdan, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Lucy. I'm Bogdan. Why did you decide to steal her? Well, according to our Chechen traditions, we're allowed to steal our brides, and I like the look of her. Why couldn't you just ask for her hand? Well, sometimes girls want to wait two years, or they want to study, or there's some other reason. You don't always feel like waiting and wasting time, so you steal her. And what if she doesn't love you? I don't know. You're asking such questions? I can't answer questions like that. Surely you must have given it some thought. I just don't understand these matters. Whether she loves me or doesn't love me, I don't know. It was an awkward conversation. The Peace Day fireworks lightened the mood. Perhaps it's a good omen that you're about to get married and it's the anniversary of the end of the war. Yeah, you could look at it that way. Maybe it's a good sign. Yeah, maybe. Oh, It's beautiful. The next day in the same village, I was at last allowed to meet Zulikhan, the stolen bride. Yeah, Lucy. Her cousin met me at the hairdressers where she was getting ready. Having been privy to so many discussions shaping her fate, it felt strange to finally meet Zulikhan. What were your plans for the future? <laughs> Well, I wanted to finish my studies, then work. She wanted to get married in two years' time. Why did you want to wait? I wanted to be independent. Do you know something about the groom? I've heard about him, but how can you know someone you've met only three times? Bogdan doesn't live in Chechnya, but in Kazakhstan. Will you go there? I don't know. Whatever our husband decides, that's what will happen. I've just found out that not only does Zulikhan have no idea about where she's going to live, uh, but she's also not even going to have the comfort of having her parents at the wedding. She's going to be surrounded by strangers, and she's going to be married to a man that she's met three times. Uh, she knows nothing about him. Do you think love may come eventually? Yes, it will. At least I hope it will.
In July 2009, Natalia Estemirova visited this very same village while investigating the disappearance of a young man linked to the Islamist insurgency. He had been shot by police and taken to this hospital. Natalia suspected the man was being tortured and went to try and get him released. She then saw him being taken away at gunpoint. They brought him out through the back door, put him in the car and took him away. We suspect the security services were responsible as they were armed and wore the badges of the local security forces on their uniforms. Clearly, people here knew what was going on, but the fact that they didn't go to the police or didn't tell anyone except for Natasha Estemirova shows to what extent people's lives are governed by fear here. And I think that we should go. A few days after witnessing the abduction, Natalia Estemirova was herself abducted by armed men. That afternoon, her body was found in a ditch. She'd been shot in the head and chest. The death of Natalia Estimirova was a huge shock to our society. And to this day, we have no idea how the investigation is progressing. Although in our small Chechen Republic, it shouldn't be hard to find the culprits. She told me that the atmosphere here was a bit like Moscow under Stalin in the 1930s, and I thought she was exaggerating. I don't think that she was exaggerating. I think we do have a similar atmosphere. Why do you think it's going on for so long? Lucy, you're asking a very difficult question. In this atmosphere that Natalia described to you, and which I have confirmed myself, it's difficult to answer your question openly. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Since Natalia's death, people continue to be abducted and murdered with impunity. In a land where life can be cut short at any moment, grabbing a woman off the street may be the one way some men can feel empowered. As I finally set off for Zulihan and Bogdan's wedding, I began to see why her kidnapping had barely raised an eyebrow. The wedding was only a few hours away, and at the groom's family home, the excitement was growing. Muller Alvi could hardly control himself. There's going to be a grandiose party. Maybe tomorrow I'll feel like getting married too. When I get married for the third time, I'll definitely let you know. <laughs> Once the relatives had gathered, the groom's party set off to fetch the bride. <laughs> Meanwhile, Zulihan was preparing to leave the family home for the last time. As the elders walked through the gate, she got ready for the wedding ceremony, which would be conducted by Alvi. When he arrived, he was less than pleased. Look, I don't want to see a single hair. We've said it in our sermons, and I've said it a hundred times. If she makes a vow and she's not covered, the vow won't be a proper one. Only when Zulihan's body was covered to Alvi's satisfaction did he begin the wedding vows. <coughs> What's her name? She's called Zulikan? Now we'll pronounce the vow. I, as a man, will speak as a man, and you will pronounce your vow as a woman, in God's will. That was it. Zulikhan was now married. Her bags packed, the groom's cousin led her outside. <laughs> Zulikhan, 
لا لا حقش تعالى ماشي يا رفع As the bride was driven away, relatives wept, while others threw buckets of water in her wake, a symbol of fertility and good luck. I found that really moving. I actually feel really sad. I mean, the grandmother asked me, uh, what's the groom like? Is he a nice boy? And I found myself in the position of knowing more about uh, the man that her granddaughter's going to marry than she does. And that seems to me um, really quite unfair. So began a traditional Chechen wedding procession. The young people had come very much prepared. I really don't want to get out of the car at all. There's so many, look like some really serious weapons that people have got here. The war may be over, but you still see guns everywhere you look. Stray bullets often claim lives at Chechen weddings. Traditionally, anyone's allowed to block the wedding party's progress. They only move once they've been paid. As the convoy hit the open road, the driving became increasingly chaotic. <laughs> That's a 10-year-old at the wheel of that car. Maybe he's 11 or 12. That's the max. And look, look at them. They're just kind of driving along the grass patch. I'm sure there's going to be an accident. And so, after yet more burned rubber and bullets, Zulikhan arrived at her new family's village. Bogdan's father, Umar, was delighted. To be honest, I've waited for this day for a very long time. Usually people get married at 18 and 19. But the war happened. Lots of people were killed, my relatives and so on. But now my boy's 30 years old and we couldn't wait any longer. On her wedding day, Zulikhan is expected to be the picture of modesty. While the guests celebrate, she stands silently in the corner. the festivities, I went to sit with the village elders. Alvi began by giving thanks for Chechnya's new era of peace. The mood was relaxed until one man brought up the war with Russia. Alvi and the others felt uneasy and the man was told to be quiet. I get the impression that the oldest man around the table is getting quite twitchy about anything that is too political and he wants us to go. Um, he doesn't like the fact that um, uh, the man next to him was talking too much about the war and about how they were betrayed by the Russians. As I watched the fancy footwork, it seemed extraordinary that this had all started with Zulikhan being snatched off the street. I want to say, and I say this with respect, I think it's cruel. For me, it's cruel. 
For you it's cruel, for us it's the way things are. You came here to study our customs, what we like, what we don't like. For us it's not wild and it's not cruel, not at all. I'm sure that if she married someone out of love, someone with no money and no education, in five minutes they'd divorce. It's a month after the wedding, and I'm traveling to Kazakhstan, 3,000 miles to the east of Chechnya. This is where Bogdan and Zulikhan now live. In 1944, Stalin deported the entire Chechen nation here. Those like Bogdan's family who survived the ordeal made this country their home. Zulikhan! <laughs> When I arrived, Zulikhan was making breakfast and appeared very much at home. She gets on well with her mother-in-law, Rosa, who's enrolled her at the university. At the beginning, though, it wasn't easy. I didn't like it at all. I was homesick. Did you manage to see your mother? Yes, I managed to say goodbye to her. What did she say? <laughs> She didn't say much. She said, live your life, be good, do everything you have to, basically. Bogdan's family organized a boat trip to celebrate his recent marriage. It was Bogdan and Zulikhan's first big outing as a married couple. Below deck, I asked him how he felt about Zulikhan's distress when he kidnapped her. Women's tears are just because they don't want to leave home. But really, they're in agreement. To understand this, you have to be a Chechen woman. Do you think it's good what happened? It's good. You could say that it's a good thing. I've now got used to it. I don't know why he did it like that, though. I was probably in a rush. I wasn't planning to get married and told him I wasn't planning to. So maybe that's why. You know, if I told my girlfriends in England what happened to you, they'd be absolutely shocked. Well, that was my fate. What can you do about it? That's how it was meant to be. Never mind. It was an idyllic scene on the boat, but I got the feeling that many of the guests were simply relieved they weren't in Chechnya. That was certainly the case for Bogdan. Everything is in the hands of God, but I am unsure about the situation there. Until it sorts itself out, I don't really want to go. I followed Bogdan and Zulukhan's story, and despite the way it started, I hope their marriage is a happy one. Chechens cling to traditions like bride stealing, but I wonder if this is really compensation for their powerlessness in a land ruled by fear and violence. Zulikhan had no say over her life, but I'm not sure how much Bogdan had over his either. For them, the free Chechnya so many fought for is still a long way off. Thank you.